senior project manager. Uh, and he's a tire derived aggregate specialist for C. GHD Incorporated. Um, take it away. Okay. So I worked for many years for Cal Recycle, which is our government um, part of our Cal EPA. Do I just close out? Could you help me? Yeah, let's just or get it ready and press start. Here's your uh, what presentation are you doing? Oh, sorry. This one. I mean, I used to toggle back and forth, but it's fine. Just we can start the PowerPoint as long as I can get to the video. Let me make sure two slides. Press escape. Okay. Yeah, let me see. Oh yeah, well, I, mean, I would have made a mess of it. Maybe we'll just play the video and then I'll just go right to the PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, one second. Probably gonna have to erase, take that one down to push that. Oh, you want to take it down so there's yeah. only mine up there? Or to get the video over there. Okay. Well, while you do that, let me just talk a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so, just so you know, anyway, I have spent a lot of years with California working on their tire drive aggregate program, 18 plus years. Everything I'm going to show you, I've been part of. So, feel free to ask questions. Hopefully, I have the answer. We also have. Uh, produced this called a tire drive aggregate usage guide. And there was a pile of them in the back. And if there are no more, feel free to contact me. It's a downloadable document as well. And it's also on CalRecycle webpage. You go to calrecycle.ca.gov, put in TDA, and all the things I'm going to talk about, plus a whole bunch more, are, are there available. I mean, I could spend four hours on this topic, and I'm going to try to squeeze it in 20 minutes. We have a whole series of videos we've also done for different types of applications. Today, I'm just going to focus on road repair, um, and <clears throat> but there's other applications this material is used for, and it's all available on the website. And this is also kind of like a summary, um, a component of like this presentation. So it's a good reference to have. And feel free, if you have questions after all this, to contact me. Um, I am glad to share my knowledge and talk about this topic. What I'm going to do is I have a PowerPoint presentation, and I usually introduce this topic with a short video. We have a whole bunch of different videos. I'm going to use the shortest one, so hopefully we're not catching a nap, which I'm fighting myself. Um, and then I'll go into a PowerPoint, which is going to be case studies, different projects that we've gone through that are road related, and, and uh, we'll talk about the benefits. At least we got a rock guitar. <laughs> Tire-derived aggregate, more commonly called TDA, is a valuable, recycled, and sustainable resource made from waste tires. In California, the TDA program is administered by CalRecycle. We offer grants to help state agencies, municipalities, and private construction companies get their civil engineering projects off the ground. CalRecycle has provided millions of dollars to a variety of projects that each used over 500 tons of TDA. Every automobile and truck tire on the road is a resource. 
More than 40 million are replaced each year in our state. A significant number are turned into tire-derived aggregate. TDA is made from shredded waste tires, millions and millions of them. And these small pieces of rubber tires have many incredible uses in a variety of civil engineering applications. Heavy fill materials such as sand, rock, and gravel are time-consuming and expensive to collect and move to construction sites. Since TDA is lightweight, it can be transported to the construction site at one-third the cost. CalRecycle has a committed staff who will assist in the planning and development of your engineering projects that will utilize tire-derived aggregate. TDA is extremely effective for roadway repair. In Sonoma County, a mountain road has washed away every 10 years. TDA helped bring the cost of repairs in at 50% of the county's estimate. In Santa Barbara County, engineers estimate that the TDA repair will last four times longer than a normal road, which uses conventional fill material. Many megawatts of electricity are generated from methane gas. TDA is used as a fill to help collect the methane gas from landfills, saving hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. TDA is also very cost-effective for uses in landfill, retaining wall backfill, and stormwater systems. TDA successfully mitigates the vibrations caused by light rail, allowing trains to move through bedroom communities early in the morning and late at night, very, very quietly, saving BART, LA Metro, and VTA millions of dollars. Research testing at UC Davis and UC San Diego has shown that TDA could withstand a jolt much greater than the 1989 Loma Prieta quake. BART understands this data and now uses TDA for earthquake protection underneath their tracks. City and county officials, as well as engineers throughout the state, are taking serious notice of TDA's effectiveness when it is used for all these applications. CalRecycle's Tire Derived Aggregate Program offers an environmentally safe, cost-effective, recycled resource. In its own small way, TDA can help contribute to the health and well-being of our Earth. It's or part of private, uh, or is it, is it an agency with it? It's a government agency. Okay. It was our integrated waste management board. Okay. So that group used to deal with all the waste sites sure. in California, and then as politics and time has moved on, they have focused more on recycling issues. Okay. You, Gordon? No, I'm walking in. So mine's. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm ready. Oh. Did you get it recorded? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I am walking there. Okay, so we're good. Okay. Yes. Good. Let's do this. And I have to just start to record on it. One. Only one. Just so this works, right? It's still good. Okay, I think you're good. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm really happy to be able to come and talk about the topic um, out here. And there's, uh, I really enjoyed listening to all the other stuff that happened today. It's a learning experience for me as well. Uh, so uh, we're going to skip through this. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, here is where I say we're going to play a video. We already played it. Now I'm going to talk about roadway applications. So I'm not going to touch on some of those other subjects because we just don't have time. Um, but feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in those subjects. Um, the Cal Recycle program that has been pushing this in the state of California and I've been involved with for 18 plus years, this is their, their goals. Basically, they want to outreach and share uh, and want to show the beneficial properties of the material. And when there is perhaps something that isn't known that, that would really help engineers 
figure out how to use this material and, and take advantage of the beneficial properties, they support research. So as you saw, there's, there's a good amount of research that happens. And if we come upon something where engineers are asking questions or certain, you know, professionals are wondering about its behavior and we don't have that data, then that becomes something that is on our radar to promote. And then we'll go do that research. Um, and that's how the Cal Recycle TDA program works. They also coordinate and work with the power, power processors in the state. So uh, we're really involved with all the different levels of how to use this material, how to make it, where it comes from, and all that kind of stuff. All right, <clears throat> so why would you use this material? TDA, Tire Drive Aggregate, was an acronym that was placed on uh, waste tire shredded up. And we did that on purpose as a group, I think, in the nation, so that um, we could talk about this as a resource, as a material. This, this is not a waste anymore. We've defined the, changed the material and defined the properties, and it is a material like a gravel. That's why we chose aggregate, right? It's really kind of an aggregate replacement of sorts. What are the beneficial properties? It's lightweight, one third the weight of soil. It's free draining, very high permeability. It will not hold water. It won't hold water. It won't wick water. So we use it to take to put into sites, particularly in civil engineering applications, where we want um, we, we we want no more saturated conditions. We have a lot of uh, sites where saturated conditions and the rain, and we get failures. And then we'll rebuild it, like some of these you'll see, and they've been rebuilt three or four times over the years. And this solution, you will not get saturated conditions ever again. Of course, you want a subgrain so you can let it out on uh, control. Um, it's a good thermal insulation, low earth pressure, which is part of being lightweight. It's a good thermal insulation, um, better than five times as a minimum, better than soil. We don't do a lot of that work in California, but we certainly are looking for projects where we can use that beneficial property. It is durable. I usually have a picture of my favorite place in Mexico I go travel to, and it is lined up on all the bumpers for all these boats when you go fishing and you go do all that kind of fun stuff, and they've been there for 30 years, sitting there in the ocean, and they look just like when they were placed. So they really don't degrade. Um, <clears throat> it's compressible, which can be depending on your project, can be both sides. You may want some of that, or it may be a reason uh, that you need to have design considerations. It may be the cheapest solution. Everything you're going to see, and that's sponsored by Cal Recycle, it always is the most cost-effective solution. So these projects will be ones you're seeing in terms of them compared to their alternatives. Um, and then it helps the environment when you use this sustainable infrastructure, which is at least in the West Coast, and I think is growing, Sustainability is a really key word. You want to have systems where you can continue to do the same methodology over and over again without a dead end down the road, like a, a natural aggregate resource. Eventually, especially in those regions that were up earlier, what are you going to do when you don't have those resources or they cost so much? Changes the dynamics. So these are the beneficial reasons why we, we would uh, use TBA. <clears throat> All right, so there is the ASTM guideline B6270. We just went through uh, the group uh, ASTM trying to update it. It's a great resource. It has all types of references. And here's some of the things that relate to road work that come out of this guideline. Construction practices, geotextile separator, 10-foot lifts, then a little soil separator, then another 10-foot lift. Um, the relative dry density compaction this is in place, 50 pounds. 45 is usually what we find we get out, off of all of our sites after it's said and done. And a minimum 10 ton vibratory steel wheel compactor, six passes. It is a method spec. No stopping work for density checks. You just have to have, the, the joke is you have to have an operator with six fingers. It's got to be able to count to six, goes over that section, then moves on to the next one. So there's a lot of benefits in construction compared to other materials that we currently use. Uh, there are two types in the ASTM guidelines, type A and type B. They are relatively, not, it's about nominal size. And what we have found, I'd say this on the side kind of, is that there really isn't a difference. It's all about constructability. So six to 12 inch nominal pieces, it's gonna have about the same properties and all of the engineering values you want as a type A. So we kind of, in California, we're steering towards um, changing that or suggesting changes to that so that there's just TDA. Um, <clears throat> leachate, so we have done a lot of work on this, 
And it is also outlined in there. You can find the references. We, this last round, made sure to put all of the work that California has sponsored with different universities about this topic into the reference. Basically, it can be placed above or below groundwater, and you're going to have iron coming off of it, and that's a secondary water standard, and then it, it quickly attenuates to very, very low levels. And that's, that's the punchline for that. Gradation specification, this is just showing, this is what we use, just showing the type of uh, sieves and what your requirements are. And you can see over here, this is, this is kind of internal, so to speak. This is our proposed. What we're really looking at is we've looked at all the projects, we've taken all the data of all the different gradations, and we found that they all perform great, and we don't really need to stick to this, this A, B thing that was presented, but we haven't yet presented a change. But I'm telling you, it's all about the same. Uh, so here I'm going to go through case studies. Lightweight fill for road embankments, road slide repair, that's like a slip out we call them, and then low impact development. This is a new category associated with stormwater, where they want to capture on all new uh, impermeable uh, development, they want to capture the first flush, the first runoff, put it into um, BMP, of, of, uh, LID, low impact development, best management practice, which we call an infiltration gallery, basically adjacent to the roads or the parking lots or the buildings, and they require this in California now. If your project is over so such a size, you have to do a BMP, and so this is one that's very beneficial. The reason it's beneficial is TDA has a great void ratio, so when you compare it to gravel, you have the same um, same trench. You fill it with gravel, you fill the same size trench with TDA, and you can fit twice as much water in the TDA trench. So we're talking about void ratio of 0.3 versus 0.6 or something like that. All right, <clears throat> case study. This is embankment project. This is Dixon Landing Highway 880 out in, San, in South Bay, south of San Francisco. Um, it is an on-ramp to a major Highway 880. It is two 10-foot lifts up to a bridge abutment. It's an on-ramp. We put some sensors in there, and of course the contractors just ran them over. So we didn't get much data out of this, but it is uh, performing great. 660,000 tires. There it is. You're looking down at it before it got integrated into the highway, and then you've got added extra lanes and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> there it is shortly after construction. Uh, this has been there since 2000. Uh, not a problem. Any, in, in, you know, just sitting there functioning. Uh, we also have uh, Confusion Hill Embankment Project. This is up in the northern part of the state. It looks very similar to here, but maybe a little more hills. We had an alignment of a highway that kept failing every winter, uh, so it was constantly under construction. They did a realignment, a whole bunch of excavation, pretty bridge, another pretty bridge, excavation, and this is the TDA section. So here's how TDA was used to solve this problem, is down here you had this red mountain creek. This is in a region where fish are really important, so disturbing creeks and disturbing water areas is a no-no. And so in order to actually carry the load of this new alignment as it came back over the old alignment, um, you would have had to come down and take out this culvert and put in the culvert that was designed for this loading. Instead of doing that, they chose a lightweight fill. This was Caltrans. Um, the DOT, and they had options of all the types of fills. TDA was the most cost effective, and it's what they used, and it went in right here, solved the problem, so they didn't have to change the culvert because the loading is the same. There it is, 270,000 tires. There's your minimum 10-ton ro roller. We always say be cautious when you use rubber equipment. You'll have to uh, you'll have to fill it because it will develop slow leaks. If you can use all steel, you're good, but there are steel belts that come out of the TDA that are in the TDA, and sometimes they'll create little leaks. That's the only construction thing, really. Other than that, it's all standard equipment to, to work with TDA, so you don't require, you don't have to go to get, a contractor doesn't have to do anything different than they're not really, that, that they haven't already done. They just have to look at it like this is a different aggregate. Instead of thinking it's different, it's not. There it is afterwards. You can see that 60 feet down here and 60 feet down there is the culvert I was talking about. The guardrail is put in. There is actually four feet of separation here, specifically so the guardrail would have soil to get into. And this is a pretty uh, uh, high, lots of loading here. So they, want, they didn't want to come back ever. So there's four feet. When we do serious highways in California, we put four feet of separation. 
uh, then there's the TVA. When we talk about light loaded roads or rural roads, we go to 18 inches. There's a typical cross section. This is to talk to people not like the folks in this room, but decision makers who don't actually understand any geotechnical issues. I go through all this and kind of tell them what a slip surface is and that the idea is we're trying to lighten the load. These slide repairs that you're going to see is basically the road is the driving force. We're not talking about situations where the mountain is falling on the road. We're talking about situations where the road is actually the top of the driving force. And then, of course, if you were to buttress it, you would buttress it down here. But the idea is to lighten the load in here. There's uh, Marina Drive. This has been done for, had been sliding and repaired for many years. And of course, as you know, when you come back and you put, um, you put more asphalt or dirt or whatever it is and bridge that sliding gap, all you're doing is increasing the driving force and you're just pushing the road to failure in the future. Here it is. Well, first we dug down here. The benefit of this approach, when you look at alternatives, is that this approach, you don't necessarily have to excavate everything because you're really just lightening the existing situation to the place where your factor of safety is acceptable. You're not actually excavating out the whole mountain and rebuilding it, which is a typical way we tend to do things. Here it is. This is how we receive the tires in California. We, uh, they come in a 40-foot walking floor. There's 30 cubic yards of material in place, material there. Again, no stand, no, no special equipment. You can use a dozer. You do one foot lift or 18 foot, 18 inches of lift, and you go your six passes, and then you go on to the next one. You can actually place it on an angle. Uh, you don't have to go, uh, you, as long as your, as long as your uh, compactor, vibratory compactor, will climb it, you can place it. That's another benefit of construction. And in here, there'll be sub drains that are fairly visible somewhere in there, where we have sub drains in the bottom of each of the layers, just to get incidental water out. 133,000 tires, save the county 90,000 over the alternatives they had on that particular project. There it is shortly after construction, sub drain, we rerouted some water that was coming down so that we didn't put pipes through it. That was the first uh, road slide in California where the state had sponsored it. Clearly, you're not going to use this road, right? This is uh, what I like to call a typical example of saturated condition failure. This is out in a wine country. And what had happened is down so that the downslope of here, the, the uh, vineyard owner had um, plugged up all of the drain system from this initial construction with vines. They had encroached. And the way that vines work in California is they even when they came in and fixed it, they left the vines. Anyway, that's my pet peeve, I guess. Um, so clearly, saturated conditions failed. Here's the solution scene. This is a typical design like that design I showed you, 150,000 tires. This was done not even by a subcontract. This was the county's own forces. Um, and there it is afterwards. It is called Geysers Road. It goes up to a whole bunch of geysers, natural thermal geyser plants up in the hills, and so it gets a lot of heavy traffic. Um, and the road performs great. No problems. Okay, this one, we have a nice video of this. If you go look at the website and you want to see more of this project, this is a steep project. It was in the short clip of video as well. This uh, soldier pile situation here, in this county, they just have a crew that goes out. They don't really engineer it. Put, put one there, put one there, put one there. And that's how they fix a lot of their roads because they have their own uh, equipment for putting in soldier pile walls. This, when we excavated this and finally did this with a TVA repair, there had been three series of walls in the years. So this had had at least three failures. So, uh, and all due to saturated conditions, right? Now you've got to put soil back in. The moment that that soil gets saturated, loses all of its strength, and away it goes again. So here we go, 330,000 tires. The interesting thing about this project is politically it got started at the end of the year and it was done in this construction was in the rainy season and this is where we proved in California that you can place and get compaction with TDA in the rain. You can't really do anything in the mud but we were able to continue placing and compacting our TDA even when we were raining. Of course it wasn't dead losing it and then there was a line going into the mud store. So anyway, 330,000 tires this one saved the county $600,000, substantial for them. 
Santa Barbara. This is a different type of repair. It isn't that design that I showed you. This is a shallower repair where we're dealing with soils directly underneath the road that are poor. Um, and this happened after fire season in Santa Barbara, and they had huge amounts of fire trucks up in here because half these houses burned. So the loading was intense, and then it started to um, compress. And this, so we went down six feet. This was not a major thing. We just went down six feet, and we lightened this edge. This is all, you know, ritzy homes all around here. And we were able to stay within the easement, and we just went down six feet and took this half of the road out, left this half open, um, and then put TVA in, and then put their uh, engineer section back on top, um, saved the county $90,000. This is similar, we're talking about behind retaining walls. This is in LA area, Inland Empire. Um, this is cast in place. We have developed a standardized design for that in conjunction with our DOT Caltrans that um, we are now giving out to folks that can, if they wanted to design a cast in place, um, we can give you the design that is vetted. And then you could just use the sheet and design your cast in place and you save money in the concrete and the steel, depending on how you choose to go uh, in the design there, uh, because you have a, a less of a force against it, I mean, that prism behind your wall. When we spent years working with Caltrans. We've done tons of research uh, because we're trying to get our DOT to embrace this. So we have all the information possible on this type of construction and use. Here it is just to show you how we do it. <clears throat> Geotextile wrap, burrito wrap, <clears throat> we call it. And then, um, you know, when you're constructing, if you have like this, you have pieces that didn't quite make it in, you push them all into this section after the wrap, clean up your site. Um, and then we've done calculations to understand the cost savings. You get about $200 a linear foot uh, when you're talking about these type of walls where you're like expanding a highway and you're trying to gain the lane or something. There it is. Uh, just a snapshot if you want it. Of course, just contact us and we'll send you the PDF. We're going through it again because we found we have developed new data like the, the internal shear strength of TDA, which we were using in the past 19 or 25, and we've done a whole bunch of research, and we know it's 30 to 45 now. So we're going back through some of this stuff to just put it in there, even though I don't think it's going to change this design. We want that data available to everyone that's looking, has to have the latest data that's backed up with current research. That's the other side. Okay, light rail. I think you saw that. The idea is it saves a lot of money for rail systems. The vibration attenuation and that, that concept can be used in a lot of different ways where you're, you're, uh, mi you're mitigating the vibration that's traveling in the soil. We're not talking about air, we're talking about ground mitigation of, of uh, wavelengths. And so what used to be this was the technology that you used to need and then we've now gone through the process and this is this is what you can do now. You can put this underneath, and it saves you know 800 to 150. We just did a project, and we were talking with the contractor, got all their numbers, and they use a TDA instead of the floating slab te technology that you saw in the picture or something similar, and they saved about four million dollars in the project by using this application. And um, a great success. And so all the light rail systems in California, when they have to mitigate, because what they're really mitigating against is is the neighbors that are living there, the ground will vibrate when the train goes by, then their house will vibrate. <coughs> so this is a barrier to mitigate that frequency transfer. Uh, LID designs, this is a new thing in California, uh, but it's working great. I've been working years trying to get them to do it. Now we are doing it. It's in our grant process. These are the projects we've completed in the last two years. We have one in construction now. That's the one I want to show you. Um, so the, the idea is this is new construction. There's roofs and parking lots, and all of it drains into these infiltration galleries, either from any impermeable surface gets drained into the infiltration gallery and captures the first flush. Well, design, this particular one happened to have piping in that same area because you get this huge savings. You can get your water volume, and then you have extra room to do other stuff, put some kind of piping in it or whatever the situation might be. We call them rain gardens, bioswales, and they're all that's all this component on top, and this is the infiltration gallery below. There it is in construction on that particular one. Wrap it in burrito wrap, trench compactor, 
If it's you put it pipes in, you got to think about buoyancy. It's an inexpensive solution, but you need to think about it. You might have to put some 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 kind of security security on those pipes. Then it gets covered. Here we have DIs being placed on four feet of this material to show you that you can actually get your elevations, even though the material is compressible. Just have to design for it. If you're going to do overbuilds, you're going to put a lot of weight on it. Then you do an overbuild calculation. So if you need it to be 10 feet, you're going to put a lot of weight on it. You might have to put in 11 in that stage of construction. It's a simple thing to to you know, work on. Uh, that, and then here it is, the, the rain garden or bioswale afterwards. Okay, another project. Same thing, different project. I want to get to the last one because that's the coolest one. Here's one is redevelopment. This is in Ukiah. And this is really neat because what, what, what and we actually did the, we actually did this design. It was a GHD project, but one of our clients got the benefit of working for this, working with the state. Is what happens is you get this, uh, this DI. It comes in and it feeds this gallery that you don't see, right? It's underground. And then when that's full, if you have a high flow event, the water bypasses it and goes into the existing stormwater system that's already there. So this is a great retrofit approach. That's why I like to show it. So here's the place that what, what end up happening is a Costco going in, a whole bunch of development, and so all this road is getting redone. Well, that triggered for us that we need to deal with stormwater. You have to implement a stormwater uh, BMP. So here's the existing uh, system, which is functioning just fine, and then right up gradient, we put in and there's like 20 of them in this job. This is just one of them. We put in a gallery so the water will come down in the first flush. We'll go in and fill up this and infiltrate. When this is full, which we haven't seen, but in case it ever gets full, the water it won't be able to go in there and it'll bypass it. It'll go into the existing system. So we left the existing infrastructure. We didn't have to rebuild it. There, here is that same spot. I tried to choose the same, the same spot. There it is. Excavate the area. Here's the existing system, not touched. There, put the TDA and all the things. There's some clean outs, which you probably don't need, but our designers are really thorough. They like to be like that. And then here it is. Now, I haven't been able to go back and get the grass yet because they haven't put the sod on, but that would be the next picture. But they haven't done that yet, so I can't show you. So that's the series of how you put these in. The cool thing about it is that this application, see, you just fit them anywhere. See, here we had you know, meandering sidewalks, they didn't touch any of that. They just found the areas inside the existing sy system and put their infiltration galleries in. So we anticipate seeing this a lot because there's huge benefits to that. When you don't, you don't have to take out trees, you know, there's so much savings in this approach. Because of that volume I talked about, you get twice as much volume. Thank you. <laughs> any questions? So have you ever used it behind a box? Especially in a rural apartments where you have uh, Cal, our Caltrans is there. We have not been able to get them to give us one of those projects. Okay, so the, well, it's we, been we, thought of, we, and we would assume that it's beneficial. All our seismic research shows that it would be the best solution, but we can't seem to get there yet. We're trying. Is that a bummer? Yeah, well then it'll be able to handle it better. It. it won't. Exactly. It won't hammer effect because you'll have exactly. some compressibility. Yeah, so having experience with being on two projects that have had tires in them. This, one, this style that we're showing? One was shredded, one would fail. Failed, okay. Okay, the shredded tire project was put in in, let's say, 96, okay, and failed in 2012 on the slide. Okay. Okay. In the state of Wyoming, just curious as to if there's any design life that you're expecting for these slides. And then when we went to mitigate the slide the next time, we could not dig up any of the tires for some various reasons. But the secondary, the real question becomes, for rural states, how do you acquire enough tires to do this? Because we had trouble getting securing tires for the failed one around the corner from the shredded one. So, there's a lot of questions in there. Right. The first one is there the guidelines, the ASTM D, the guidelines that have been developed, and that all these projects and everything in California that has been done is use use these guidelines. They were developed 
after the 90s because there were a couple problems. I have looked at those very specifically. I don't know if it's the same one you're talking about. We had lots of problems. And the fill wasn't this fill. The fill no. was like garbage and just so much. The design had air channels coming up. There were so many things wrong with those failed projects. And that is what instigated the, the ASTM guideline. So we just use the ASTM guideline, and we have no problem with any of our projects. That's what I can speak that I know, the knowledge I know. Bales. And, I, and the bail issue is you know, secondary. We had trouble getting tires. Now that or issue is all about, that's the business side of things. So I understand, but you've got to have a supplier and you've got to have the right regulations in that particular community that allows for either the stockpiling if you don't have a huge population or some, so there, there becomes coordinating issues when you're dealing with that. When we deal with rural, rural projects, I was on Monday, I was just out in a very rural location. We're putting in 10, 10 slip outs are getting repaired. Um, out in the forest lands, right? And um, you know, getting the material there is a big component of, of the project. So it, it's case by case. And, and we have a whole different set of regulations than other states, for sure. Ours are very restrictive. Our, our, uh, our vendors cannot stockpile you know, more than you know, a couple cars worth. It's crazy. And we keep fighting internally in the state to change these things. So what we end up having is the way it works in California is the moment that it is sold, the moment that it goes to a stockpile location, it's no longer regulated as just the material, construction material, and a lot of that stuff just goes away. But I can only speak for, you know, that's all good um, government rules and things. So is Calvary Calvary Cycle Cycle just about tires? No, Calvary no. Cycle is about everything. All, all things. They yeah. have people in there working on, uh, you know, birth control, extra birth control pills and where they go, and, and OxyContin, because that goes into our system. So they have recycling methods for every type of thing. And then only, the list is only getting bigger. Got it. We should probably break since we have five minutes. Yes, sir. OK. Ten feet, and then you put a soil separator of a couple feet. And we have actually, and then you go another ten feet. And, and, and that, that is theoretically a heat sink. We have done recent research that isn't published yet. That's, we don't see that concern, but that's the guideline. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.